If you visit Somerset in England and climb this mountainous steps, you will reach Breen Down Nature Reserve, a rocky outcrop that sticks out to the Bristol Channel. And at the end of it, you will discover a ruined 19th century fortress. Known as Breen Down Fort, this fort's original purpose, like almost everything constructed by the British military throughout history, was of course to defend against the French. It was built in the 1870s, and its existence is in large part thanks to Queen Victoria, after a visit she made to France in 1855. She had been invited by Napoleon III and got to enjoy a lavish supper at the Palace of Versailles and the Universal Exhibition in Paris. This was a very significant event as Victoria was the first British monarch to visit Paris in over 400 years. The two nations had recently entered an alliance against Russia during the Crimean War and Anglo-French relations were certainly at an all-time high. However, despite all this, Victoria had become very concerned after witnessing the size and strength of the French Navy. So much so that upon returning to England, she went to Parliament to recommend improvements to the UK's defences. This led to the establishment of a committee in 1859 known as the Royal Commission on the Defence of the United Kingdom, which proposed the construction of many new forts along the British coast. The Prime Minister at the time, Lord Palmerston, loved the idea and heavily promoted it, leading to the new forts becoming known as Palmerston's Forts. Breen Down is a Palmerston fort that you can still see today, Construction was completed in 1871, and the fort remained in service until 1901 after one of its powder magazines detonated, forcing the fort to be decommissioned. However, the destroyed sections were demolished and the guns towed away by tractors, allowing the fort to actually reopen in 1913 as a cafe. The lady feeding her chickens is Mrs Jenkins, who lived at the fort in 1916. The fort became a popular spot for tourists who would go into the underground munitions stores and carve their names into the walls as a record of their visit. The cafe remained open until 1936 and Breen Down was eventually recommissioned in the 1940s to protect against invasion during the Second World War. The fort is accessed by crossing this short bridge over a moat. You can see that the entrance is flanked by two buildings. The one on the left is a barracks and the one on the right is an officer's quarters. In the 19th century, this officer's quarters would have been divided into four large rooms, and records from 1881 show that it was occupied by master gunner John Bond, and he actually had his wife and six children living here with him as well. On the outer wall, you can see what looks like castle arrow slits. These are carbine slits which soldiers could fire from in defence of the fort in the event of an invasion by land. There are several along the barracks as well, and here you can see, well, if my camera would focus, you could see the kind of view they'd afford. During the Second World War, the building was used as an officer's mess, and it would have been even more cramped as it was subdivided into nine rooms during this period, although I don't think any of the officers had their wives and children living there at that time. Directly opposite the entrance to the fort, there's a set of steps, and these lead down to one of the 18th century powder magazines. 100 pound barrels of powder would have been lowered into the store by pulley, and stored in this chamber here. Of course, at that time, the floor was covered in wooden slats and the barrels were stored on wooden shelves to prevent sparks. Soldiers working in the magazine weren't allowed to bring any metal at all inside and had to change into a calico uniform with bone fastenings and rope sold sandals. At the end of this passage, there's a recess near the ceiling which would have housed a lamp to light the magazine. Thick glass would have shielded the lamp to help reduce the risk of any ignitions. As previously mentioned, one of the fort's powder magazines actually detonated in 1900. This was powder magazine number 3, which had been storing 3 tons of powder at the time. Subsequently, the explosion was massive and destroyed much of the southwest wall. The cause of the explosion is debated, but an inquiry found that a gunner, by the name of Haynes, had deliberately fired into the magazine, possibly as an act of suicide. This building is the barracks, and this room was originally built to house up to 20 soldiers in the 1800s. Although census records from the late 19th century suggest that only around 4-5 to five gunners were actually living here, and much like the officers' quarters, they would have shared this space with their wives and children too. Their beds folded out from the wall, and doubled up as chairs when folded up to help save space. The threat of a French invasion was looking a lot less likely at this time due to their defeat during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. The Palmerston forts were being seen as a pointless expense now and were often referred to as Palmerston's Follies. During the Second World War this space was repurposed as a canteen and recreational area for the soldiers stationed here. 
The rectangular hole in the far wall was a serving hatch put in place for easy access to the small kitchen. You can still see the iron roller above that would have held the shutter. Accommodation for soldiers during this period consisted of numerous wooden huts located outside the fort. Although none of them remain, you can still see their concrete foundations just outside the entrance. One of the stranger sights within the fort is what appears to be a cannon buried upright in the ground. This is in fact a Georgian cannon and it was used as a gun mount about which one of the 19th century guns of the fort could pivot. The fort was armed at this time with seven 7 inched rifled muzzle loading guns. Muzzle loading meaning they were loaded from the front and rifled referring to grooves on the inside of the barrel that improved accuracy. You can see the iron rails about which the guns would have rotated and the metal rings used to secure them. The guns had a good view over the Bristol Channel and could fire a 112 pound shot over a thousand yards. During the Second World War two new batteries were built in 1941 and here you can see the inside of one of these batteries and this space would have housed a World War I era 6 inch naval gun taken from the deck of a scrap ship. These guns had a range of up to 20 miles, far greater than the width of the channel itself, and the batteries were covered by a type of camouflage called plastic armour. This wasn't actually made of plastic and was a mixture of tar and stone chippings supported by a grid of iron girders. This was removed in the 70s due to safety concerns, however you can still see remnants of the iron supports. If you look out from the battery you will notice a small building out from the fort. This is another new addition made to the fort in the 1940s and it is a searchlight station. Two of these stations were added to the fort and they would scan for enemy ships across the channel. Being in such an exposed condition these spotlights were protected by reinforced concrete and heavy steel shutters. They were also heavily camouflaged. If you look closely you can see that this particular one has had its cantilever roof flipped back by a heavy storm. You probably also noticed a set of rails heading out to the cliff edge. This is actually a remnant of the secret weapons testing that occurred at Breen in the 40s. Near the end of the war when the threat of invasion was far less likely, and especially in the build up to the D-Day landings, boffins used the fort and surrounding area for special weapons testing. They were known locally as the Weezers and Dodgers and were based in a requisition Victorian pier in Western, a local town. These rails were supposed to carry a seaborne bouncing bomb similar to the one used by the dam busters into the sea. However during testing the trolley that carried the bomb picked up far too much speed and crashed through the buffers at the end of the track and the whole lot flew into the ocean. This was unfortunately not the only experiment to go wrong at Breen. A device known as an expendable noisemaker was also tested in the sea. This was essentially a rocket propelled foxer. And if you're wondering what a foxer is, well foxer was actually a code name used by the British for a very clever device that was towed behind ships and generated large amounts of underwater noise. And you're probably wondering why did ships need such a device? Well in 1943 Germany introduced a new type of torpedo. Referred to as NATs by the British Navy these were German Navy acoustic torpedoes. And what these torpedoes would do is home in on large sources of underwater acoustics which would usually be the churning propellers of a ship. These torpedoes were relatively effective and so the Allies needed to come up with an effective countermeasure. This came in the form of foxes and these were essentially just simple collections of metal tubes which could be towed behind a ship and as water passed through the tubes they would generate a large amount of noise and this would hopefully be more than the ship's propellers and this would therefore confuse the torpedo causing it to miss its target. This is somewhat similar to the way in which modern flare systems confuse heat seeking missiles. Anyway, the boffins had developed their own foxer in the form of a rocket that would generate rhythmic detonations to confuse the torpedoes. They tested it by firing it out to sea, however during the test the rocket turned inland and exploded, with debris landing in a nearby chicken run. The farmer was reportedly, and quite understandably, not very happy at all. Another new addition made to the fort in the 40s was an engine house, seen here in the fort's moat. This was built in 1941 to house a 22 kilowatt diesel generator that would power the new spotlights, gun emplacements and administrative buildings. Another 5 kilowatt generator supplied the accommodation huts outside the fort, however orders were eventually given to connect the larger generator to the soldier supply as they kept causing power cuts by installing new higher wattage bulbs. 
There are a few other buildings in the southwestern corner of the fort, and these would have had various functions throughout the fort's history, including stores and other facilities. This building appears to have most recently been used as a latrine. In fact, it still smelt of urine when I visited, but I suspect this came from more contemporary sources. There's also lots more carbine slits, and this is a nice example of a firing step, which would have given soldiers a good view over the channel and in the distance you can see the second searchlight station. Breendown Fort is an excellent fortress, although it is not the only structure of historical significance to be found on Breendown Nature Reserve. Archaeological evidence suggests humans have been present here for centuries, with there being evidence of ancient field systems and even a Roman temple, although most of the more obvious structures only date back to the early 20th century. One of the more peculiar constructions is this massive concrete arrow. This is actually a directional arrow and was used by bombers during the Second World War to help direct them towards their test ranges. And here you can see six light machine gun emplacements, where soldiers would have practiced with Lewis machine guns by firing at targets in the bay below. There are also various ruined bunkers dotted throughout the down. Well, that's about all I had to say. I'm sorry if I've rambled on. There was way more history than I expected when I first started researching this place. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and uh, thanks for watching. I wonder what they're trying to tell us.